Hello everybody, this is James Chai, RFRF Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, registered nonprofit. Today is November 4th, 2019, episode number 32. And um, this is me uh, getting to a bit more streamlined. Today I'm going to talk about the topic of, uh, which I mentioned on Friday, when your dog gets attacked by another dog. What happens? What do you do? How do you deal with your dog uh, afterwards, especially your dog who is dysfunctional? How do you help your dog feel better? How do you help your dog feel as if they're they're safe, despite the fact that there was a bit of a fight and, and for your dog, they're going to feel a little bit upset and hurt and they want to find out, okay, um, how, how am I going to be taken care of? How is mom and dad going to, or mom or dad, um, how are they going to be able to make sure that I feel all right? And that's, that's always the big question. So I um, uh, just want to kind of talk about that. And I put down in the notes here, uh, and I'll just go through them and I'll run through them as I as I go back and and people who who come in and watch the live broadcast you'll be able to see that I put other notes of other things that I've been talking about or been talking uh, a few times about or want to do and and anyhow so I'll go over that um, uh, so when it comes to your dog being attacked by another dog uh, so we're gonna go through the list of it and then I'll go over it again the uh, first one is minimizing your dog getting attacked by another dog at the off-leash park Scan the park area, scan the entrance gates, scan the perimeter. Tell people you are teaching, training your dog social etiquette. When another dog approaches, watch for your dog's, uh, watch for that dog's behavior, walking, trotting, running towards your dog. Maintain eye contact with your dog. Communicate with your dog. Notice the other dog. Loudly announce to uh, your concerns to the other owners in the dog park. Uh, walk naturally, speak conversationally. Stepping in before necessary. If you suspect the other dog may become a problem, what to do? If there was, is a fight, uh, think of your dogs as children. Stopping a fight after the fight. Resetting your dog. Aftercare. Remain in the area. Do not avoid dog parks. Be assertive at the after uh, at the at the doggy airlock, and be careful. Uh, actually, uh, be clear when noticing another dog approaching your dog firmly standing up for your dog. So these are the, the things I'm going to go over and um, I'm going to keep this nice and short so um, that way it'll make it easier for everybody to, to follow through. I can see the comments when it is coming through. Uh, I won't be able to get to any of them probably if I don't catch it. So what do we do when your dog gets attacked by another dog? And the most difficult part is the fact that when you have a dysfunctional dog, either skittish, fearful, or a dog that become somewhat behavioral uh, of a challenge, uh, reactive, aggressive, etc. all these things that they call that. What do you do? First off, you want to make sure that your dog, who already is a concern to you, you want to make sure that your dog is not going to have any issues. Hey, Daniel. Um, so you want to make sure that your dog is not going to get further harmed, further traumatized by any type of behavior that happens when they're out in public with you. Of course, your dog is trusting you. And I talk about in other episodes where it's what do what do we do before we leave the house, when we get to the outside of the door, when we get to the street, how do we let our dog know that they're still safe? Because they're going to be somewhat reactive. I am working on an article about uh, what to do when your dog has a nightmare, uh, also known as does your dog dream about us right? or, or you? And, and that's a part of it, what type of cognitive processing that happens. Uh, but overall, your dog has to feel safe, wants to feel safe, needs to feel safe. It's the it's the tenement of uh, tenant of a, a, any um, good relationship. A codependent relationship means that you can trust the other person. Your dog, in their case, uh, they want to be able to trust us. They want to be able to say, "Hey, you know what? You're taking care of me. You're keeping me safe." I can trust you. I don't need to be reactive, skittish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I can be a bit more natural because when your dog is at home, your dog's happy, right? Zevi is running around. She's playing with toys. She's playing with the other dog. She acts goofy and everything like that. But if she's a skittish or, or dysfunctional dog, when she goes outside, she'll completely shut down, start yanking on the lead, start trying to attack other dogs or trying to run and hide, depending on what type of behavior the dog has of dysfunction. But you notice that, again, when they're home, they do whatever they want. They're casual. They're running around. They act goofy, and they they're super endearing and cool. But the minute they step outside, then it's a bit of a scare, and they become worried. The biggest thing for a dysfunctional dog is to feel safe, regardless if they're reactive, aggressive, skittish, OCD. They're doing these behaviors to make themselves feel safe. I um, uh, so when you go to the dog park, 
this is the big thing for a lot of people who have dogs that are functional outside socially that they're not having any issues as per se they can still take their dog to the dog park they might be somewhat skittish or or or, or, or a little bit kind of uh but they're okay to walk to the dog park and again we're talking about the dogs that are socially manageable in public not the ones that have some sort of reaction and aggression or other um, uh, negative behaviors so again this is for the the somewhat average moderate type of dog not the ones that are dysfunctional that are highly uh, dysfunctional if you have a dysfunctional highly dysfunctional uh, dangerous predatorial type of dog obviously the things that i'm talking about does not apply uh, the disclaimer don't try anything that may cause harm to yourself or harm to another dog or harm to another human being do not put yourself or your dog into that position whatsoever that's my legal disclaimer uh, again, I may be talking on some topics or subjects which uh, are reference to what I deal with, with the dogs that I work with. Uh, don't try to apply that to your own work. Just have to say that. Okay, so when you get to the dog park, um, you want to make sure that your dog's not going to get attacked by whatever dog. And if you have a smaller dog, uh, I have Great Danes. Um, as my personal breed favorite, so I always walk the Great Danes, and whenever I have a Great Dane, they're the big dog, they're always the ones that people say, oh my gosh, look how big that dog is, and they start freaking out on their own dog, like picking up their dog and saying, oh my gosh, that dog's going to eat you, and other silly comments. They don't understand how to deal with it, and they're going to have concerns that you, their own dog is going to get in trouble, even though sometimes their own dog is a bit of a handful. They're going to say, oh my gosh, let's watch out for this bigger dog. And it tends to happen. I've had that personal experience as well where my one of my Great Danes was accused of uh, having a, a fight with a smaller dog. But you know what? Every single dog compared to a Great Dane is going to be relatively smaller. So it's that battle of that prejudice. Uh, people who own pit bulls, unfortunately, they go through the same type of horror of, uh, of uh, discriminatory social perspectives that uh, you know, pit bulls are bad. I mean, they're phenomenally gorgeous little dogs. They're cute pit bulls. Their bums wag when the tail is going all over the place. They're super happy. They're highly codependent, which is why the uh, pit bulls end up becoming somewhat reactive at times. Um, so, yeah. So, when it comes to just working with your dog, when you get to the off-leash park, as you approach the off-leash park, you're your dog's bodyguard. That's it. No ifs, ands, or buts. You are your dog's bodyguard. You're making sure that your dog doesn't get attacked. And for those of you with the reactive dogs, you're making sure that your dog doesn't react to other dogs because then everyone goes, oh gosh, there's that guy again. He's with his Great Danes that are, you know, whatever, right? I always hear that all the time. Even if my dogs do nothing, it's here comes the guy with the Great Danes. Okay. So you want to scan the area as you approach your off-leash park. You can look all over the area. You're going to, like a predator, you have to be your dog's guardian, but you have to be a predator. There's nothing wrong with being a predator. There's nothing wrong with having that little bit of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, evolutionary drive in you, right? Darwin, whatever. We all have a predatorial instinct. Every single one of us. doesn't matter if you're a passive person, you're really nice. You still have your drive. You still have your objectives. You have your goals. We are all predators. Absolutely. We are all Canucks. We are all predators. Haha. -ha. So we are all predators. We have that in us. Use that when you get to the dog park. Use that predatorial behavior inherent inside of all of us to protect your dog, right? To protect your dog. That's what you need. Use that inside of you to protect your dog. Scan the area of the dog park as you approach it. Check out who's there. You may recognize some familiar faces. You may recognize new faces. You will. You'll new, recognize new dogs, you'll recognize the area, you'll recognize where people are clumping together, where they're standing, right, in groups. You'll notice that there's always various cliques, uh, cliques of groups, you know, the, these, the popular people, the kind of people smoking pot and all that stuff on the one side, and then, the, you know, the other people are just there because they have to take their dog out for a walk, and they're going to leave as soon as their 15 minutes is up or 20 minutes are up. Survey the dog park. Make sure that you're cool with it because if you survey the dog park even if you're a little bit nervous if you survey the dog park you're going to feel better because you've made a survey you've identified what's going on you've made yourself alert to the environment of the dog park beautiful part to step off on because again then your dog realizes that's what you're doing because he can tell your dog can see where you're looking around mickey not funny you, you um see always 100 percent concentration Always conversational tone when I'm talking to my dogs. Um, 
So when you're walking into the dog park, your dog is going to see you looking around as you're talking to them. And I always tell people, right, keep talking when you're looking around so your dog knows that you're looking around, blah, 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 and your dog understands. Because you know what your dog's done? Your dog surveyed the park themselves. They've surveyed it at a tenth, two tenths, three tenths of a second. They have made an, an unimaginable amount of field of vision processing throughout the entire aspect of it. They've developed that template of what the park looks like. They're used to that park. They know what the park looks like. They can tell where everything is there. They can tell who's out there, who's standing in which groups, which dogs are there, if they're familiar with the shapes of the dogs and, uh, and the way the dogs process field of vision. is. Uh, I'll get into that some other day. But they will see all the... Minky! Seriously. All right, thank you. Okay, here he comes. Um, so you... You you got to do what your dog's doing. He's surveying, right? Your your dog is afraid, or freaked out, scared. Your dog is going to survey the area. As your dog's walking, they're going to keep looking around all the time. Same thing when they approach the dog park. In their head, they're like, "Okay, I'm going to the dog park. I'm somewhat safe, but I hope you know the other this other dog doesn't show up, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. They may not be able to consciously present that ideation, but they can definitely feel that anticipation, anxiety as it starts to build up, right? Latent feelings. PTSD, whatever you want to call it, they can feel it. We want to make sure that our dog knows we're looking around. So you scan the entire park area. You scan the entrance gates. If it's got more than one entrance gate, you want to make sure that you're watching out for the other side. See if that door's unlocked or locked, right? Because sometimes people don't lock the door. They just kind of walk in and out. They don't really care or they just didn't pay attention. And if you have more than one gate, you might see another dog coming into that area. That might be somewhat... Um, an issue for your dog. So again, if you're aware of what's going on, you're aware of the exits and entrances, or whatever you want to call it, uh, the egress and the exits, if you want to make sure you look around, your dog understands that, you also understand your perimeter. It's a great safety, safety application. It's a great way to apply safety if you are a person walking alone at night or in a, in a difficult area is a great aspects of following through with your predatorial survival instincts is to look around. So do that with a dog park. Uh, people who've, who've worked with me, uh, they're, they're always like, holy cow, you know, James is always looking around. And it's because it's important that I am scaling the area, that I'm surveying the area, I'm understanding what's going on there at all times. Anthony, no. Okay, so that's what you want to do. You scan the perimeter as well, right? You want to look around, you want to see where everything is going. And then, guys, stop it. No, Anthony. Anthony's trying to get the bone from uh, William. Um, that's what they, they they cry, they whine, address the resource guarding on that part. So, um, as Pepper and the dogs there start acting crazy, I tell them it's okay and ignore it, just like with my kids. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you want to tell them to ignore it and all that. Um, well, not necessarily ignore it, but you're acknowledging the fact that you're seeing the danger. So, um, when you when you go in there, here's the other thing. I kind of kind of rush things today because I had a few a couple of phone calls to to follow through on it. One of the things that you want to do is when you go through the doggy airlock, and the doggy airlock is where that the double doors, right? You have the entrance, and then you have the little space in the middle, and then you make sure the back is closed, and then you walk through the front. So you want to make sure when you go into the doggy airlock, if somebody is approaching. You have to, with your dysfunctional dog, or even just your any dog, you have to say to the person, could you wait, please? I'm going to walk through with my dogs. I'm going to let him get ready to go through the entrance, and then, you know, then after you. But if you could just follow that protocol, please, because I'm training my dog on social etiquette. If you keep telling people that you're training your dog on social etiquette, how to socialize, how to behave, etc., not only does it say to them, hey, you know what, um... This person here is trying to train their dog, so I should respect that. But you're also teaching that person passively to reflect on their own dog and go, oh, maybe I should train my own dog too for social etiquette. And it's the same thing I was just saying as uh, Hooligan's mom today was the was the fact that, you know, when you get into an elevator and you go up to you know office building and you get up to the you know 15th floor and the door opens and there's people waiting to get in. They just come and start crashing right into the elevator. And you're like, dude, I haven't gotten out of the elevator and you're already coming in. There's no elevator etiquette. We want that etiquette to happen at the doggy airlock so that people are waiting, especially if your dog is reactive or skittish and another dog comes in. And if the other dog comes in and say the other dog is reactive or, or, or overly exuberant and your dog doesn't know how to take it and takes it adversely or feels threatened 
Or if your dog is skittish already and that dog comes in and it's like, hi, hi, I love you, I love you, I want to say hi. And your dog's skittish and scared already, it's going to cause your dog even more issues because, again, that's an affront to the personal space, the personal perimeter. Even if it's a doggy earlock, it's still that part. And, again, the doggy earlock is never a good place sometimes because you can see some pretty um, – uh, uh, physical interactions that are negative right and there can be fights there and all that so again hey you know what i'm coming through the doggy airlock could you please just wait let me go through first then you can come through there's no rush we have you know it'll take 10 seconds literally just give me that time please if they don't listen to you you're gonna have to insist or else you know what in some cases you'll just have to step back and wait if people are ignorant they're gonna be ignorant with their own dog as well with their own dog's behavior so again then you start identifying who you don't want to hang out with because these are the ignorant people who don't respect that part. Once we start creating that etiquette, we start creating you know respect for each other. But we teach our dog, you teach your dog that you're maintaining the security of the environment for them. Right? It's a codependency. I talk about codependency. I talk about dogs being overt codependents, humans being covert codependents. But it goes down much, 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 much deeper in the psychological aspect and the evolutionary traits of that part of the behavior, emotional isomorphism, etc. But it goes down to human analogy, simple terms, codependency. We want our dog to understand that we can trust us, right? We see the, the part of mimicking and following body nuance behavior and peripheral vision, etc. But we want our dog to pay attention to us. We want our dog to know that we're protecting them, that if anything happens, we will step in first before our dog has to react back. And a lot of times that will be shown by the way your dog is behaving. They may look at you, etc., etc. That's a different topic. So when you're in the doggy earlock, go through, make some steps with your dog. You can, uh, first off, you can take the leash off. I always take my dog and I give him a hug and people just stand there staring at me like, this guy's cuckoo. This guy, this guy loves his dog too much or something like that. I don't really care because for my dogs, whoever if I have one or I have a bunch, for my dogs, it's important for them to know that I have care and control because if they trust that I have care and control going into the doggy airlock, they're going to continue that trust in me as we get into the actual dog park because there are going to be times where you're going to have the rambunctious, errant, overly exuberant dogs or even the possessive, regret, uh, aggressive dogs and they will cause an adverse interaction with your dog. And if your dog is already riled up and doesn't think you can trust them, getting into that dog park without them feeling tr safe and so forth, they're going to become even more so because instead of just being at reset at zero or one, they're now they're, they're, they're like at three before they go in. So you want to make sure that you want to reset your dog. And resetting will happen throughout the whole conversation of this topic tonight. Okay, so... Um, so you're going in, you've told people, you know, I'm training my dog for social etiquette. Again, it gives them the excuse so that they don't have to be jerks to you. They can respect that you're doing that. And if they don't respect you, then you know what? Then these are people who don't know how to handle their own dog and will not take responsibility if their dog causes issues. And that's the one thing I want to really re re uh, re re reinforce is that if you're not careful and you're not watching your dog and you're not, you're not your dog's bodyguard, you're not surveying the area, you're not showing your dog you're protecting him, if your dog gets attacked because you're not paying attention because you're on your cell phone or whatever, you're talking to people, your dog gets attacked, whether or not it's in the dog park or anywhere. But if your dog gets attacked, they will feel that you did not protect them, that you did not have their back. And I've talked about this before. You're walking down the street with your friends and some random stranger, crazy guy comes up and punches you in the face and starts beating you up and your friends just stand there going, Oh, well, uh, you know, James is getting beat up real bad, right? I would never trust my friends ever again. So your dog has to be able to understand that you are protecting them. So, again, that's why it's important to reset, survey, etc., etc. When you're out there and your dog is running around and everything like that, maintain eye contact with your dog. Always, always. I don't care if you've got 15 friends there, if there's some hot-looking new woman there that you want to talk to. I don't care. Take care of your dog because your dog's dysfunctional. There's no conversation, no communication. And then when people come up and say hi, because, you know, I got Danes. When people come up and say hi, I say, oh, hey, yeah, so forth. And I'll be blah, 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 blah. And I'll say, and I'll say my, and I'll go back to my dog. I'll be like, Anthony, Zevia. I'll be da, 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 talking, talking, Zevia. I will always, throughout my conversation, re-engage with my dog. 
because it allows my dog to understand that they are being acknowledged, that the part of the conversation is a subliminal aspect of that behavior, but it also allows my dog to know that I'm keeping guard and I'm checking in. Codependency, right? Just use codependency as a really basic paintbrush and you'll you'll see it well everything will make sense you understand why dogs process abstract memory and blah 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 like it just it's tail behavior all that stuff like i said before the other time uh front hackles back hackles full pedal erection right what does it all mean it's subconscious and consciously rooted so all the stuff happens in the codependency behavior of that familial aspect of the dogs all right so you want to maintain eye contact with your dog letting them know what's going on if they're off wandering around if they're off 200 feet away from you, I'm going to say, Zevia! She doesn't have to look at me. I don't have to call her till she looks at me. I'm just going to, Zevia! She's going to hear my voice. I'm not going to go, <coughs> all these silly noises that most of owners do, right? I'm sure 80% of you people are like, oh yeah, that's me. I click, click my noise and all that stuff. You know, you're not from some sort of primitive tribe where they go, <coughs> and all that stuff. You're not. You look at dogs and you watch dogs and you watch canines and wolves and hyenas. They don't make that, <coughs> these human sounds. It's our anthropomorphization of what we feel is a subjective uh, communication tool, which is a clicking sound. But it's a devaluation of the dog as a being and it's a disrespect. And then that's why you don't have the codependency that happens. You see what I mean? It gets convoluted here because it's much more strained and deeper in a quantum perspective all right so here it is old james original james no rants no nothing today i'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this sucker in pretty clean um you know i want to thank deborah and leo and uh ivy and hooligan um i, I want to thank uh um oh uh, shoot there was somebody else too um uh, uh matt chun as well um out in, in washington uh i want to thank uh, a bunch of people who, who've given me some great cassian cassian as well who's given me some great advice on what and how to streamline my my uh vlog okay so yeah y y while you're in the dog park as well you want to notice the other dogs in the dog park and if you're watching your dog's personality and behavior as he's playing even if you're talking to somebody all right like i said i don't usually talk to people because i have to pay attention to my dogs but if you're talking to somebody, again, pay attention to your dog. Communicate, call their name, etc., etc. Start noticing the other dogs in the area. You're your dog's bodyguard. So you're going to look around. You're going to notice this. You're going to notice that dog. You're going to notice this dog. And you will, if you're paying attention, you will, by surveying the area, you will notice other dogs approaching your dog. No if ands, or buts. Because you're paying attention to your dog. You're paying attention to your dog here. Peripherally, you're watching. Peripherally, like Bruce Lee, peripheral animal predatorial field of vision processing you'll see it all you see the dogs coming through and you can tell when they're coming towards your dog and you're like uh-oh uh -oh. so what do you do you want to acknowledge your dog because your dog if he is not preoccupied with a toy or a ball or a stick they're going to notice the other dog approaching and you may not think they do but your dog will and when the other dog comes quicker and quicker or they start trotting over or they start running over for whatever reason, your dog's going to feel somewhat like, okay, why is this other dog coming towards me and at this pace? You acknowledge to your dog, Zevia. So your dog realizes as they're looking at the other target coming towards them, at the other dog coming towards them, like, oh, okay, my human has it. When you see the other dog approaching, you want to make it a really loud statement on purpose in the park. Hey, whose dog is that that's uh, just out here just running around because um, they're going to play with my dog and my dog doesn't do well with a stick. So um, just so you guys know, whoever's dog that is, uh, just could you just grab your dog because, again, he's going to try to grab Zevia's stick and Zevia doesn't do well with dogs taking her stick, right? Resource guarding, whatever you want to call it. But you want to announce it out loud and find a tactful, socially acceptable way instead of going, hey, whose freaking dog is this? You just want to say, who's, you know, whose dog is this? Or if you know the person, hey, uh, you know your dogs, I just want to let you know. Because what you're doing is you're warning the other dog because you're going to be talking directly at that dog. Because you're going to be watching the dog saying, whose dog is that, right? Whose dog is that? You're going to, you're going to be seeing that dog. You want, to, you want to point to that part. You're also letting your dog, I'm letting Zevia know I'm watching out and I see the other dog. Makes sense. Then your dog's like, okay, cool, all right. 
dad's got me, right? My human's watching for this other dog coming towards me. And what are you going to do? It's a difficult part. If you have a resource guarding type of dog, if you have a dog that doesn't do well with other dogs up to their face, or, you know, and again, just like human beings, we are, you know, if we had somebody this close, it would be really quite uh, irritating. Actually, when I was younger, uh, as, as I got on a little tangent here, when I was younger, I used to work out, um, you know, in the old days. And there's a guy in the gym um, who would work out and he'd come. He was an older gentleman, European descent. And, uh, you know, I would go and take a shower and walk out of the stall. And the guy would be talking to me. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, okay. I, I, you know, I'd be drying off and he'd be talking to me. And then he'd be, <laughs> I'd be putting my clothes on and he'd be like standing there naked talking to me. Because, you know, I, like, I, I don't know why. And... And he would be this close, like here I am, he'd be this close to my face talking to me. Like he liked women because he talked about it. But, it, you know, it's just Eastern European. And he'd be just standing there this close. And I'd move myself over this way and he'd kind of come towards me. And every time I moved, he'd come this If I backed away, he'd come that close to me. And his face would be that close. And it's not, you know, um, it's, just, it's just with or without clothing is not something I really want. Someone, even if it's female, a nice hot looking woman or whatever. It, that close to my face is, is just too much. It's my personal space, getting into my personal space. Get the heck out of my personal space because I can't even look at you because I'm going cross-eyed. For your dog, it's the same part as having another dog coming up that close into their personal space. We assume, oh, dogs love other dogs and they, you know, it's, they're social animals because the scientists say this and all stuff. No, your dog has a unique personality. Your dog has dysfunctions. Your dog is not going to be socially acceptable to everything. A skittish dog having another dog approach that the skittish dog is not familiar with is going to have a bit of a hard time and it may nip and may run away etc we want to make sure that when we're commenting to our dog zevia we want to say whose dog is that we see the dog coming over towards zevia we want to make sure that we're letting zevia know that we're protecting her we also by acknowledging the other dog and acknowledging it out loud we're letting the people in the neighborhood or in the park we're letting the people in the park know that there might be a problem happening. So that way you're getting the attention of the people out there who may or may not be paying attention to their own dog or may not see what happens. Starting to put eyes on not just Zevia, but also on their dog or someone else's dog that's approaching Zevia. And if something does happen, they're gonna say, Zevia was just sitting there play, or laying there playing with her stick and the other dog came over and tried to grab the stick or start playing, but there was an issue. It's not Zevia's fault because Zevia is just minding her own business, playing with a stick. Another dog comes over. That's social etiquette. That is the other owner's fault. I don't let my dogs go off and start interrupting and in interfacing with other people's dogs because it's rude. If the other dog gets up and starts playing around, absolutely, that's totally cool. But if that dog is preoccupied or doing something, task-driven behavior that's going on, I'm not going to let my dogs interfere. And I will tell them to leave them alone. That's, I will say, Zevia, leave it. You're not, stop bugging the other dog. I use regular conversational tone, and I'll do that, and I'll correct her because it's rude. And the thing is where I say here is if if our dogs were children, we would never let that happen. We would never let, you know, if, you know, there's a kid out there playing on, you know, uh, he, he's, drawing a, he's drawing with his crayons at his table. He's just drawing on his, you know, in class. He's drawing on his, on his, on his thing with crayons and all that stuff, and then, Another kid comes over, right? Your kid comes over and just goes up and starts playing and grabs a kid, that kid's crayon. What are you going to say? You're going to go up to your, your child and going to be, excuse me, that you don't go and take people's things. You don't just walk up to somebody and just sit there and, and irritate them. You don't just go, well, not irritate, but you don't go up there, right? People have personal space. We talk to our children as if we need to teach them social etiquette. This is what we need to do with our dogs, and this is what people need to do with their dogs. And if you look at the fact of social etiquette in the neighborhood when it comes to dog parks, it's pretty low. The doggy earlock, people just crowd right in. They don't care. They they have they don't care if you tell them your dog's react unless you tell your dog's reactive or your dog's wearing a muzzle. They don't care. They just they just crowd in. So you want to make sure again you, you create the communication. You want to make sure that if your dog is playing with something and another dog comes by, you announce the other dog because if something happens, at least you have more eyes, more witnesses if something happens. On top of that, you're able to acknowledge the other dog by looking at the dog, your voice is traveling to the dog, letting your own dog, Zevia, my dog, Zevia, know that there's a problem. And then if worse comes to worse, you're able to intervene because you're engaged and you're not on your cell phone and you're not talking to somebody going blah, 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 right? So we want to do that. 
uh, you want to communicate with your dog at all times, right? So, you know, we're not just talking about maintaining eye contact, but communicating, as I said. If you're on your cell phone, you never pay attention to your dog. Remember, keep your dog as if he, she is your cell phone. You spend 90%, 95% of your time on your cell phone when you're walking and you don't hit a tree. Do the same thing with your dog. Pretend your dog is a cell phone. And then you'll be much more... Um, oh, that's so gross. Uh, Anthony is eating something on the ground that's covered in dog fur. And then he's trying to spit the dog fur out. Silly boy. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, if there is an interaction or you're just feeling concerned whatsoever that you think something might happen, walk naturally to your dog. Don't run. Don't speed walk. If you want to cover greater distance, you can lengthen your stride but maintain your casualness of that stride. Okay, so think about that. So you want to walk to your dog over there, and as the other dog is approaching, you can say, Zevia, and you're just going to say it in a regular way where you don't, your dog doesn't think there's an urgency, an issue, a problem. Zevia, um, etc. And then you just walk over. And as you walk over to your dog, um, if the other dog is still there, you want to kind of step in a little bit. If, if, if it's safe, right? If it's safe, you want to step in. If not, you can stand there where the two dogs are there and you can kind of correct them. But again, you want to keep an eye on the other dog because if your dog is not going to be a reactive dog, that means they're going to behave consequentially to the other dog's behavior. It's a little bit convoluted. You'll, you'll figure it out over time as you pay attention to your dog more often. You'll see that everything's multifaceted when it comes to your dog's behavior with other dogs but you have to pay attention to your dog only and you have to tell the other people who are yapping away or not paying attention to their dog hey your dog is coming towards my dog and if you don't know what your dog is going to do my dog may not be happy with that because my dog's happy playing with a stick you should maybe take care of your dog um speaking conversationally right just keep a regular tone of voice like i'm talking right now i'm a little bit fast i'm a little bit higher tone and all that um, but you want to talk conversationally as if you're talking to your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, girlfriend, teacher, I don't know, right? So you just want to talk naturally. You don't want to make it sound fake. When you're walking over to your dog who is playing with a stick as the other dog's approaching, Zevia, hi Zevia, you're just walking over casually. It'll help to also balance out that somewhat uh, apprehension that your dog is going to feel as the other dog is approaching uh, sprint energy yeah while her back is to them too you know the the uh, that's a good thing daniel uh, writes we've had instances where dogs have flat out sprinted at our great dane while her back is to them and that's because you know what the bigger dog right target etc the other dogs don't know sometimes what that dog is and they're like oh okay let me prove myself to the rest of the dog pack um to the dog part so when, when that happens you have to step in and I've had dogs rush my dogs, and if I don't step in, my dogs will turn. And as you know, Great Danes have between 500 to 700 plus PSI bite strength, so they can literally break a, a man's forearm in one bite. So you want to kind of step in, and if your dog has her back to it, you just say her name. You mention her name so it gets her attention, because she is going to be kind of surprised to see something rushing at her, and then you're going to acknowledge the other dogs. As well, if you have to step in between, because if because the dog's not going to be at a dog park usually if they're not people aggressive, they may not be familiar with human touch during high anxiety environments, but usually they're not dog reactive. I mean, human reactive because that's why they're at the dog park off leash, and you can just kind of step in in between. And if you have to, kind of you know move back and forth and block them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what ends up happening then, um, we'll go to the next part. If you suspect the other dog is going to be a problem, right, Daniel? Same thing here is what I say here. If you suspect the other dog is going to be a problem, you got to step in. you got to physically interrupt them. Um, a lot of times the dogs are not going to be reactive to human beings. Legal disclaimer, don't do anything that's going to get you bitten by a dog. It hurts a lot, and um, it's very, very painful. And it's frightening too, actually. It's kind of scary. So uh, if you have to step in, Step in and all that safely so. If not, then you're going to try to create some alternatives, uh, whichever. But don't try to physically stop them if you think you're going to get hurt. But that's the thing. is, So you, so you want to step in between them. You want to step in between your dogs, uh, between the dog the other dog, if that's going to help reduce the amount of the, the fight. A lot of times if, when the other dog is coming running at your dog, 
uh, Daniel, and same with uh, Ivy as well. If the dog's coming running at your dog, you're going to look at the other dog and say, Stop! That's it. You're going to use a regular command. Don't go, ah, and screech, and all that stuff, right? It's not a carnival ride. It's not an amusement ride. Just point blank, stop. That's it. You don't want to go, stop. You want to go, stop. Stop. And that's it. And the dogs are stopped biting. Yeah, right. Anyway, sorry. Um, so you want to make sure that you're addressing another dog that's approaching. Often, often, when you make that loud tone of voice, stop or, hey, a loud voice, not high-pitched, because high pitch is play and pray drive aspects of it. It will hopefully, audibly, interrupt that dog's approach, and then you can be able to go, okay, stop. And then the other dog, blah, and then you say, whose dog is this? Is this rush my dog? Who cares? Call out people for poor dog ownership, for poor dog parenting. you got to call them out because there's no social etiquette, and that's why these things happen. That's why dog attacks happen often. And your dog, if your dog gets attacked, your dog pays the penalty because if you have a bigger dog or if your dog is the same size or smaller or whatever and gets into the thing, anyone who's been beaten up, I was beaten up when I was a kid. I was bullied a lot. You never forget getting beat up. The trauma never ends. You live with it for the rest of your life. Like Eddie Murphy said, that's that stuff's like luggage. So you never lose that part of trauma. Your dog develops that trauma right from the get-go. Your dog gets attacked by another dog. They get, they're immediately traumatized. Nobody can say, I got attacked and I'm, oh, hey, I'm okay. Even when I've gotten little bites where I have, you know, doesn't puncture the skin, it's still frightening because I'm like, okay, next time I do this with, the, with, with this particular dog, he, she may bite me again or well bite me. Right, so it's gonna happen in that part of it. Um, but yeah, so you you wanna you wanna stop them. Um, you wanna interrupt them. You wanna use regular conversation. You wanna you wanna just take care of it. But again, there's gonna be a dysfunction that's gonna happen. There's gonna be trauma no matter what. No if ands or buts. It's trauma. It's like seeing a car accident. It's gonna take you know if you see a bad car accident where there's a head on and one car flips over and something you know both people survive but it's a horrible accident. You're gonna be traumatized with that in your own mind as a witness for days, if not weeks. Your dog feels the same way. If your dog gets attacked by another dog or a bigger dog and they get them by the neck, right, or the soft part of the body, but they usually go for the neck, right, for those dogs that are trying to, anyways, I won't go into that part, but, but if you've ever been grabbed by a dog and bitten and shook as they try to disable you, it's really frightening. And I've had, a, a very sizable Great Dane do that to me. And to feel a giant dog grab you and shake you off your feet is is really like what you see in the in the movies. It's it's bad. It's really bad. And you got the trauma and all that stuff. Your dog feels the same way. Imagine your dog getting picked up by another animal, another dog picked up in, in that dog's jaws. Your dog is getting picked up and held in the air, which is not a natural thing for a dog not to be on the ground, right? All four paws on the ground. It's not natural for a dog to be up in the air. And then that dog's not only picked up, your dog's not only picked up in the jaws of the other dog, but shaken. And it, it's like someone grabbing you by the shoulders, picking you off the ground and shaking the heck out of you. That's what's going to happen to your dog. That's traumatic. So what, how do you stop a fight? Okay, I've talked about it in another episode. Um, but essentially, if they're big enough dogs, you can um, uh, you can use the, 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 the heel, of your palm, uh, heel of your foot with your knee, fulc not a fulcrum, but in regards to the physics, as you put the weight behind your thing and you, st you don't kick them hard, you stomp them in the sense that you're pushing through like a bulldozer pull, pushing through mud, you push through to hit them in the back of the hips, the back hips. Anyway, you're gonna have to see this. You're gonna have to go look at the episode. Uh, yeah, yeah. If it's a smaller dog, right? Smaller dogs, bulldog, whatever. They're smaller dogs. Then you can usually get yourself with your fingers in against the back of their jaw. Do not stick your hands in their mouth. Never stick your hands in your dog's mouth. To do so, or with an unfamiliar dog, to do so if you have a risk of being bitten. If you think your dog's not going to bite you, then hey, absolutely go ahead. 
put your hand in your dog's mouth, you know, do whatever you want to, you, you feel that's relatively safe. But if you're at a risk of being bitten, do not stick your hands in your dog's mouth. And people do that. And sometimes they get bitten and it's not fun. Um, but if not, if you're okay, what I do again behind the behind the, the jawbone, right, the, 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 the hinge, it's just, just like human beings. You dig in really hard and you're digging in. Sometimes the face is too big, so you have to use your thumbs or you have to use your knuckles into it and you just kind of grind it in a little bit and then they well eventually feel it if it's hard enough versus their, the, versus their amount of intensity as well, right? So you, you have to kind of play it. If not, then unfortunately, you're going to have to kick them in the back of the hips or else you're going to have to kick them in the front of the shoulders to dislodge them, etc. You don't want to kick them in the face, you know, all these kinds of things, especially if they've got a grip on your dog and you start kicking the other dog, then if the, you know, then you're going to end up ripping a lot of skin. Um, and then that'll be worse in the long run. Anyways, it's another episode uh, to, to look at. So after you, you've separated the two dogs, your dog and the other dog, you've got to do aftercare. Aftercare, right? You got to take care of your dog, help them reset. And so one of the things I do is I will give them a hug. Doesn't matter if they're bleeding or whatever it is, as long as they're not injured severely or badly, because if they're injured severely or badly and I try to give them a hug, then they will bite me and it won't be fun. So as long as it's safe to do so, and there you can hold them and just kind of keep them still for a a number of uh, of seconds, 40, 50, 60 seconds if you can. Same amount of reset time as you would normally for those of you who have hired me. That same type of reset from square one. You reset your dog, let them know that. It's an aftercare behavior. It says to your dog, you understood what happened, and you're helping them feel better about themselves. You're, otherwise, if you don't, then the, your dog is running around unchecked with that type of trauma. You can imagine if you don't go and deal with a trauma, you just keep doing the same thing you were doing beforehand, it gets submerged subconscious and then it manifests itself in some uh, abhorrent way in the future. So same thing with your dog. You acknowledge for your dog, okay, oh my gosh, you take them, give them a hug, you do the reset, you hold them the way I taught you guys, and then you give them that calmness. And after you give them that time, you talk to them in a normal tone of voice. You don't baby them. You don't. You try not to be. <laughs> are you? Are you? Oh, okay. Are you okay? Try not to do that. Try to control your breath. Fake it, right? Fake it. And you just go. Are you okay? You are not. You're okay. You're okay. Good boy. It's all right. Just wait. Just wait. That kind of language. Just regular tone conversation. When you're talking, think of what you're talking about. Have an objective in each word that you say. Just like acting, right? Those of you who know about me. Uh, just you have to have an objective in what you're saying so when you're telling them that they're okay you're saying you're okay as in i saw all this happening and you're not dead you're not having to go to the hospital i want you to just settle down and stay with me for a bit you're okay right so you want to again have objective in the way you talk same thing when we say something to somebody we're like you know and you're like oh i can hear it in the tone of voice right so after the fight you do the reset you do the aftercare remain in the dog park as long as you don't have the crazy people yelling at you, as long as you've told people in the, in the neighborhood, I mean, in the park, hey, you know, whose dog is that? You've alerted those people. They will oftentimes come as a witness and say, yeah, you know, uh, uh, Zevia was just hanging out there playing with the stick and then the other dog came over and nobody, we don't know where the owner was and we tried calling the owner, but we don't know where the owner was. You establish yourself witness. You have established yourself evidence in the sense of something happened. So that way, if it does happen, you're not having someone goes. Oh, I, I, I heard them fighting. Heard them fighting doesn't help you at all, or uh, doesn't help your dog either. So you want to again get people's attention. So you remain in the dog park. You hang out in the dog park with your dog. You don't leave prematurely. You want to give them the same amount of time when you do the reset. If you see them getting a little bit upset or hurt or whatever, you're going to bring them back in for a reset. If your dog is injured, of course, take him to the vet or else if he's got minor injuries, you want to maybe bring a first aid kit with you and put some stuff on it just to, you know, antiseptics and so forth like that. And, of course, they have fur and blah, 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 blah. So you, again, might want to do it in a quieter location. Um, but, uh, yeah, so stay in the area and leave at the usual time. Don't get hyperactive. It doesn't really help. I know I've done it too where we start yelling at each other, right? And, and it's like, you know, I had this guy at um, Tinehead Park. He was with his girlfriend and I was with one of my Danes 
and he has a, a small bully type breed dog and um, they were just hanging out and all stuff and then their dog literally went up and got freaked out and actually bit my Dane in the face and my my Dane was just like looking down at him that was it and he was just he was just like that and smelling him and then the other dog bit bit my Dane in the face not bad bit him and then of course my Dane was going to grab him and, and kill him um, because you know and so I called him off and they stopped and then the guy he was with his girlfriend and he's like the typical mid twenties douche kind of guy with a pretty girlfriend and the small uh, stature, the Donald Trump hands. So he was like that, and he was coming right. He was doing the same thing, coming right to my face like this, right. And um, he's a bit, a little bit taller than me, and he's coming up, confronting me, and all that stuff about it. And you know, you can't talk logic, you can't talk reason with these guys. And of course, he's saying, "Well, your dog did it too." I'm like, "Yeah, but your dog bit my dog first. And then his girlfriend's like. You know, you can tell she's the one that gets yelled at and beaten by this guy um, because he's that kind of douche. And um, but you have to just maintain the conversation. And I had to keep my tone of voice down because otherwise my Dane would have went, what's going on? Because this guy was this close to me pretending and trying to intimidate me. And it's like people are so dumb. Uh, I'm just going to tell you because I used to compete uh, amateur uh, kickboxing and martial arts and stuff like that. When a guy comes up this close to you, like I'm not trying to be, I'm too old now, like I'm way too old. But when a guy comes up to you and they start fighting and trying to intimidate you, whatever, this is a person who doesn't know what he's talking about. This is a person who, who has no idea how to fight. This is a person who has no idea how dumb he is because one uppercut would break his jaw and disable him for weeks. And I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not, you know, I, I had a different life when I was young, but I was not like that kind of a person. But when you, when you, anyone who's fought amateur or whatever, um, a guy this close to you is going to get his, he's going to get knocked out. He's going to have his jaw broken. Um, if you find somebody coming up to you this close, if you feel threatened, you know, obviously you have the right to defend yourself. I didn't do that with him and I wasn't going to because it's like, you, you know. His girlfriend's already seen him act like another douche uh, extraordinaire. So it's like, whatever. And I'm like, go home and take care of your boyfriend. <laughs> and he's like, going in. And as they're walking away, he's like, F you, F you. And I'm like, yeah, take care of your boyfriend, <laughs> right? Make sure you put him to bed. And he's like, F you, F you, right? So, I mean, let's face it. Mocking somebody is more fun than physically getting in because then you have a whole bunch of issues. Anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, so you remain in the area. Do not avoid dog parks. So don't go off and say, I'm not going to back to this dog park. A lot of people do this. A, your dog gets victimized, and then your dog gets further victimized because they no longer get to socialize. They're not going to the doggy daycare. They're not going to the dog parks or whatever. Or else, you know, you can go to a different dog park if, if you feel upset yourself about it. But if you're okay, go back to the same dog park again. That's all. At the end of the day, you're going to the dog park not to socialize with humans. You're having your dog there to socialize so that your dog becomes socially integrated, socially mature, and able to function as a productive part of the canine community where they get to sniff each other's bum and all that stuff. But you want to make sure that your dog doesn't have too much of a blip to their, to their daily life. The, not even their routine, but just to the daily life. They go to the dog park because it's going to keep them social. When you start pulling them back, you, 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 you remove your dog from those exposures, your dog doesn't have any other memory other than the last time we were there, I got attacked and my human couldn't protect me. And then he got into, my human got into a fight with an argument with another person there. And then we ended up leaving and we never went back. Right? Human analogy. You'd be like, yeah, okay. Chicken, right? That part of it. We're not trying to say we're not trying to be chicken. We just want our dog to understand the assertiveness, the confidence that we have in our environment and our relationship with our dog, with the rest of the environment. Blah 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 blah. Bring him back to bring your dog back to the dog park. Bring your dog either if you can't go to the same one, then bring him to a different dog park. But continue to socialize your dog. If you can't do that in the dog park for whatever reason, you don't feel like it, then take your dog for a walk in neighborhoods that have a higher dog ratio. Um, you know, Olympic Village is really good along the seawall, um, areas like that, so that your dog is still continuously um, being exposed, so that your dog doesn't think one dog is like all the other dogs, they're all going to attack me. Then your dog's like, oh yeah, yippee, yahoo. Okay, so um, 
one of the things you want to definitely make sure though again is you got to protect your dog your your dysfunctional dog you got to protect your dog no matter what so when you keep an eye on the rest of the park you're not talking to everybody blah 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 you're paying attention to them if you see a pretty girl get her phone number or tell her sorry i'm just you know maybe i'll talk to anybody i just want to pay attention to my dog etc right if they don't understand then then she wasn't right for you um so you're just going to pay attention to your dog if you see the other dogs approaching your dog you're going to pay attention to your dog you acknowledge your dog you're going to acknowledge the other dog because the other dog will hear you talking to them at them as well that's why i talked about earlier right it's all this part of it it all makes sense right it's it's a it's a it's a it's it's just good governance all right um and then firmly stand up for your dog as well. So if you have a situation where you're being confronted by people who are yelling at you and, and, and swearing at you and, and, and all that, and and that um, has been two phone calls uh, or uh, the last uh, few days that I've had with previous clients or, or clients where uh, we just talked about these things and all that and, you know, people start yelling. And one was where uh, one of the dogs uh, was just playing by themselves with their with their the, with a with a, a toy at the dog park, right? It was just a random. It was a ball that was left there in the dog park. He was just playing with it by himself, no problem at all. And then another dog, a smaller dog, a much smaller dog, basically went and up and tried to grab the ball from this other this dog, and of course a fight ensued, right? And then people are angry at the dog that the bigger dog, even though he was there playing with the toy himself, not playing with the other dog. The other dog came over and, and deliberately attempted to um, interrupt uh, the first dog's behavior. And then people got pissed off at the owner. And it's not the owner's fault. It's the dog that came over to grab the owner's dog's toy. So that's why if you acknowledge it out loud, people hear it, blah, 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 then they can't go and say, oh, I didn't see it happen. Then they go, oh, actually, yeah, you know, uh, this dog was, uh, your dog was playing nicely when the other smaller dog came over and, and stepped into his territory, right? Just like kids, again, you're never going to let a kid go and grab crayons out of another kid's hand. You're going to be like, that's rude. That's rude. Snap. <laughs> Whatever it is. Anyways, that's rude, right? Etc. So, so you want to do that. You want to stand up for your dog. Don't get upset. Don't scream. Don't yell at the people. You know, I've done it. Like I said, I've, I've, I've yelled at people and they've yelled at me as well, right? Because uh, uh, it happens. It's normal behavior, isn't it? Where we go to the dog park and we're, we're just used to people getting angry at each other all the time. But, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, people took responsibility for their dog. Nowadays, it's like, well, even though my dog came and rushed your bigger dog, and my dog got hurt because he, my dog rushed your bigger dog, and and they don't take responsibility. They don't go and say, well, yeah, you know, what, actually, I, yeah, my dog did rush your dog. It's my dog's fault. I'm so sorry. Is your dog okay? They start getting angry and they start blaming the other dog, whether it be a bigger dog or whatever. They start blaming the other dog. That's not cool. But that's because of the lack of responsibility, disrespect etc etc right so we want to watch our dogs like as if they're children like i said codependent etc and etc um okay so uh, i want to thank everybody for uh following through on everything oh my gosh i went over a oh, big time uh i want to i want to thank everybody for uh following through on uh watching my vlog and everything i will be transitioning towards a um uh towards a podcast and i'm gonna have a much better structure on that i'm gonna i'm looking at buying some equipment uh just ordered a new computer oh my gosh that's really expensive um, so I'm doing these things. I'm going to try to improve the quality of the videos, improve the quality of the vlog, improve the quality of the podcast. I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to have some great topics, and then I'm going to figure out how to do screen uh, recording, and then we'll do live. I'll do live uh, dog training with people, and you'll see some most amazing observations that are happening with the work that I do with them. Uh, every single person I've been banging on 100%, and then I teach the owners how to do it themselves, and then their dog feels loved all right thank you everybody have a great evening i appreciate all this enjoy yourselves be kind to other people spend an extra 20 seconds listening to somebody and then say you know what? that's it i'm done right no more no more talking all that stuff right it, it lets people through i talked about that before the psychology behind that we want to just make that a part of it but we want to also improve our own humanity ourselves and let our own selves evolve viscerally and uh, like I said, I, I'm not like this kind of guy when I was younger. I was a bit more of a rambunctious person, not a bad kid, didn't do anything horrible. But you know what? 
uh, as I get older, I, I do see the importance of taking care of our society, either locally or globally. Uh, you're welcome, Mary. Um, it's just important that we need to change the world. Everything that I do, if I didn't have a, a, a better positive demeanor, a personality perspective on dogs, I would be dead already. I would have been killed. Uh, I would have been killed uh, quite, off, uh, quite a few times. Uh, more times than I could count, I would have been killed by uh, a, a number of dogs. And dogs can tell if you're not a true heart, uh, true compassion, etc. And so you can do it yourselves. Be patient. Put that human side of you from your dog, what they taught you, what your dogs taught you, put that into the human side. Let's change this world. Let's kind of at least make it a little bit cooler and more fun so that we don't have to worry about any uh, crazy people. But hey, you know what? We This is the world we live in. We're technologically driven species now, so which is kind of unfortunate. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Enjoy. And...